Good morning. I'm Rade, and I'd like to welcome you all to New Perspectives panel discussion on reimagining emotional education. We are honored to have with us Gitanjali and Dr. Kiran Singh as panelists and Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko as our moderator today. New Perspectives is sponsored by our university and hosted by Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center located here in South Carolina, USA, and Surat, India. All three organizations are founded and supported by HP Rama. New Perspectives is a platform for the exploration and discovery of contemporary applications of Integral Yoga across diverse fields of endeavor. Emphasis is placed on in-depth research as well as subjective investigation including intuitive inquiry and experiential discoveries. In its quest for a deeper understanding of critical issues facing the world and avenues for their resolution, New Perspectives recognizes the paramount role of the individual and the necessity for self-development and self-expression. In this regards, Sri Aurobindo states, the child's education ought to be an outbringing of all that is best most powerful, most intimate, and living in its nature. The mold into which his action and development ought to run is that of his innate quality and power. The individual must acquire new things, but he will acquire them best and most vitally on the basis of his own development type and inborn force. And so too, the functions of an individual ought to be determined by his natural turn gift and capacities. One who develops freely in this manner will be a living soul and mind and will have a much greater power to be of service to the race. With this in mind, New Perspectives introduces a series on integral education inspired by Sri Aurobindo and the mother's version of self-fulfillment and spiritual progress supported by a comprehensive yet individualized approach to education. According to the mother, an integral education must in five, involve five principal aspects relating to the five principal activities of the human being. The physical, the vital, which includes emotions, the mental, the soul or psychic, and the spiritual. Today, our new perspective panelists will address the vital aspect in reimagining emotional education. So I'd like to now introduce our moderator, Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko, with the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center here in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. Vladimir is a scholar and instructor of Sanskrit and Sanskrit literature and a researcher in Vedic, Vedic and Vedantic studies. He was a resident of Araville for over 25 years and a student and educator in Integral Yoga since his early 20s. Vladimir, I'll now hand it over to you to introduce our panelists and perhaps elaborate a bit more on the topic for today's discussion. Thank you, Radha. Yes, um, it's um, it's a very important and very interesting um, format what we created new perspectives in integral education, and today we are touching upon the most um, uh, difficult part of this education. Uh, uh, known as vital education, the education of our uh, feelings, emotions, and sensations of our senses. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, two prominent speakers with us today, uh, uh, Kiran, Dr. Kiran Singh mm -hmm. and uh, Gitanjali, uh, who uh, will... Um, speak on this topic and we'll, we will open discussion uh, about um, um, their presentations. So, uh, Kiranji is the, as she asked me to introduce her as a, a scholar and the, um, uh, uh, the researcher in the integral education. And she is uh, now um, a director of uh, Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Surat. Uh, Gitanjali, on the other hand, is the um, has many credentials, of course. She uh, was educated in uh, Sri Aurobindo Ashram, was very close to Amal Kirhan. And um, yeah. 
Um, so if uh, I was to say a few words about Gitanjali would be um, uh, the um, that she's a social entrepreneur and educationist. She's uh, also very, having founded many different businesses and social ventures. She is now um, setting up Himalayan Institute of Alternatives in Ladakh and be, becomes its uh, and is its uh, founding CEO and dean. And also she is a student of Sri on the mother uh, of Sanskrit language and literature, Vedas, Upanishads. Uh, so she is a spiritual student, student of Indian spirituality. Um, with this brief introduction of the panelists, I would like to say a few words about the topic. <clears throat> and when I was a um, professor of Sanskrit in uh, our university, uh, we had a very interesting uh, survey or discussion of what would um, students of the university like to be, to get in their life. And what was interesting, they all of them, mainly like 90% of them, spoke about happiness in life, to have a happy life. So, uh, Mother speaks about this, and uh, it is here is her quotation, the conviction that one has the right to be happy, and we are all convinced that we must be happy in this life, leads as a matter of course, to the will to live one's own life at any cost. And this attitude, by its obscure and aggressive egoism, leads to every kind of conflict and misery, disappointment and discouragement, and very often leads or ends in catastrophe. So, so is there any way out from this situation, how to be happy and at the same time have a fulfilling and meaningful life? This is the major question of our uh, panel discussion today. And um, here we come to this importance of vital education, how to deal with our senses, feelings, emotions, how to use them in our life so that they would help us to build a truly happy life. Uh, so with this kind of brief introduction, I would like to give microphone to uh, Kiranji, Dr. Kiran Singh. Please um, uh, have uh, introduce us to this vital education. Oh, thank you, Vladimir Ji. Uh, thank you, Radhe Ji. Uh, for uh, brief and good inter introduction. Uh, it's certainly, you know, very concerning topic today to talk about uh, vital education or emotional education. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about emotional learning and its relevance in this panel amongst esteemed uh, scholars. Before I talk about the need of emotional education, I want to put forward three observations. The first is that we are living in an intellectual golden age. The advancement of knowledge over the past two centuries has been astonishing, whether it is uh, our understanding of the universe, our measuring and processing of the data, formulating new concepts of ha or harnessing the full potential of nature. Our knowledge and information about the world has increased drastically. The second observation which I want to put that almost all educational institutes are struggling to keep up with the changing needs of the times. Administrators are frustrated, teachers are struggling with the advancement of immense information and rapidly changing environment. And in this situation, students are paying the price. Everyone is looking for a way to reform and transform a troubled education system. And the third observation which I want to put forward is that all of us know the harsh reality of the current education system. The lack of holistic learning and lack of education acceptability, uh, applicability. We focus on quantitative, quantitative evidence of intellect. 
we look hard for grades and standardized test scores because we believe they demonstrate ability and predict success at educational institutes however we know that intellect is only a part of what makes people succeed in their work and personal lives and not necessarily the most important part either there is a prolonged silent restlessness in educators and parents both that regarding the kind of education that learners are receiving nowadays the current generations of students are not able to manage themselves even as they are intellectually advanced why is it that even after excelling in their domains of education learners know very little about managing their own mental health why do so many learners struggle to empathize to show compassion and kindness to peers people in various situation at home and work and for the users of their services and products of in their professions especially as we experience situation like the current pandemic we have to face the reality that the education system does not do good job of instilling values that can make learner resilient in changing conditions another important question we need to ask is who are the ideals we introduce to our learners one will find that the ideal that most student gravitate towards would be a business tycoon or intellectual mind which is which society has projected as an epitome of human kind even as there is much to learn from their lives and journey there is a need as well to present to our learners people who live for human value and ethics to reflect on their journeys their struggles and challenges and understand how they overcome this in life this value based learning is necessarily rooted in human condition of basic human value and consciousness and whenever one talk about value emotions are always layered beneath it in our indian knowledge system ram and ravan from the ramayana present these two characters representing two sides of learning ram with inner and holistic understanding of the world who is known as antaryami and ravana was called brahma gyani he who even as as an intellectual being with great knowledge and understanding of the world still led a life that led him down a destructive path for himself and others around him so before we start thinking of uh, reconceptualizing the education system i think everyone involved needs to ask themselves a very important question do we need to reimagine what education can really be if yes then it is time to shift our paradigm towards value based learning and that what that would come from emotional education and its applicability in life the moment we talk about value based learning environment and emotional education one is talking about learner centered environment because emotions are rooted in and expressed through human beings not simply in content it is human that decide how to explore and understand content and it is not content that decides how human deal with it in the course of two last two decades emotional intelligence has become a very important indicator of person's knowledge skills and abilities in the workplace educational institutions and personal life research shows that emotional influence attention memory and learning decision making creativity mental and physical well being ability to form and maintain positive relationship and academic and work performance as each individual develops their unique world views shaped by their past experiences the emotional development of a person can give big impact in growth of a learner the emotional development of a person is filtered through the perception of the outer world as each person perceives the world in different light it leads to the feeling of different emotions young it be that surrounded by invisible structures referred to as as culture environment normally the knowledge we gain from this structure allows us to navigate the world but if we can change this invisible structure then we gain mastery over our emotions 
emotionally intelligent people recognize this and use their thinking to manage their emotion rather than being managed by emotion daniel goleman a psychologist and writer uh, uh, from collaborative from academic social and emotional learning at yale university has proved by giving neuroscience evidence that iq is only a part of what makes people succeed in their work and personal lives and not necessarily the most important part either iq that is intelligent question and eq and iq together determine growth and development of a person it is possible to be intellectually brilliant but emotionally inept which causes many life problems skills such as self awareness emotional emotional mastery motivation empathy and social effectiveness have greater impact than raw intelligence career success outstanding individual performance leadership and the creation of successful teams emotion such as anger humor anxiety optimism melancholy and happiness play in all aspects of our lives but people can learn how to manage these emotion and use them as power to transform their own lives as well as outer world also there are basically uh, there are basically five major pillars of emotional intelligence if we consider that is one is self awareness that is in knowing one's emotion second is managing emotions that is in handling feelings so they are appropriate third is motivation in marshaling emotion in service of a goal fourth is recognizing emotion in others in empathy which is fundamental people skill and fifth is handling relationships which is very important a skill in managing emotions in others we will elaborate these five pillars now the first pillar is awareness shri arvindo and mother outlined vital education as the education of the sensory and emotional aspect of the person they outline the goal of education that includes vital education as a complete holistic transformation and its approach is multifaceted vital education has two principal aspects the first concern the development and use of sense organs and the second is progressing awareness and control of the character culminating in its transformation the education of the senses again has several aspects which are added to one another as being grows grows the education first starts with awareness the sense organs if properly cultivated can attain a precision and power of functioning far exceeding what is normally expected of them actually we overlook in our educational institution from the beginning itself we just focus on the content and here mother talks about sense uh, uh, sensory uh, honing the senses they elaborate that to become conscious of the various movements in one's self and be aware of what one does and why one does it is the starting point the learner must be taught to observe to note their reactions and impulses and their causes to become a discerning witness of their emotion movements of feeling fleeting feelings instincts and the background motivation that support them together with ancillary emotions to enhance vital education mother has suggested to use dance drama art and music and here i must mention that in indian knowledge system bharat muni's natya shastra as a treatise on aesthetics is a great resource to understand emotional feelings and the states from transient to permanent and the clarification of emotion which can be called rasa rasa is composed of two letters that is ra which means to give sa which means motion bharat muni defines rasa as a bhava bhav vibhav anubhav sanchari sayogadra ras nishpatti which means that through the co mingling co appearance or sanyogad of vibhav anubhav and sanchari bhav a maturing ripeness or production of ras takes place vibhavas stand for the determinants anubhavas for consequent of sanchari bhavas for transitory mental states which are accessories to the basic mental disposition this knowledge lies you know from long back in our indian knowledge system we overlook this uh, uh, bharat muni natya shastra very conveniently do the arts learners get an opportunity 
to understanding emotional experience and ability to move them towards aesthetic experiences. Third, second uh, pillar is managing emotion. So till now we have come to know that being aware of our emotion are a crucial part of mastering emotion. But the question arises, why should one master it? The world seems to be a stage for emotional expression. Should one master the emotional aspect just to manage out of one or for some other bigger reason? As a part of understanding ourselves, our inner self, knowing ourselves as each part of our being interact and influence each other, the mastery of emotional or vital aspects of oneself is critical. A neuroscientist, Mark Brackett, director of Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, has created RULER, RULER method for working emotional skills. RULER is the acronym, recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. Once you start recognizing, you know exactly where, uh, where this derives from. This EQ model is an evidence-based approach to social emotional learning that supports the entire educational community in understanding the value of emotions and building the skills of emotional intelligence. This is one of the various methods in which one can adapt emotional learning in classroom. Third pillar is motivation. Creating and maintaining positive educational climate is critical to emotional growth. If one creates a pyramid of the student of one class, and organizes according to their cognitive ability, that is IQ. Normally it happens in the classroom. We judge our students by their intelligence and EQ level. You'll find that at the top are those who are at higher IQ level, which is very small number. And at the lowest level is the large number. So the difference is vast and we don't pay much attention to it at all. To enable growth of the student with a high EQ, that is emotional caution, one has to enable learning environment that allows for emotional awareness, reflection, and motivation to spur on. It is this ability of student to grow their EQ that enables them to work towards contributing to society as a fundraiser, social worker, or life civil. The fourth pillar, recognizing emotion in others. To elaborate on this point, I want to share a brief anecdote from Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, on empathy changes our paradigm and the way we look at the things and how we react to the situation. He shares that he was traveling by subway in New York when he saw a man with kids who entered in the train as well. The kids started making noise, yelling and disturbing others, but father kept his eyes closed. Everybody was irritated. Ultimately, the author got up and asked the man on why he was not taking responsibility of his children and making them quiet. The man responded saying that, oh, he didn't realize his kids were making noise. They were just returning from hospital where their mother had passed away. He said he did not know what to think and did not know how to handle it either. The author reflects, can you imagine that I felt that mo at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly, I saw things differently. I felt differently. I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's, man's pain. Feeling of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. He said, your wife just died? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? Everything changed in, in an instant. This deep change in understanding of situation that led to a paradigm shift is about looking at the same thing with a radical change, whether it be regarding incidents of everyday life or core concepts and practices of given domain or discipline or field. The conversa conversation of the people in the train in, uh, in the anecdote speaks to the great divide in human abilities that lies between mind and heart or more technically between cognition and emotion. This ability to integrate thought and, thought and feeling to offer action through empathy falls in the domain of emotional intelligence, which is the crucial role of emotional functioning. 
and the fifth and last pillar is handling relationship with people in the world so till now we may have understood that emotion pertain to just individuals individual and gets triggered when the person interacts with the outer world such as feeling of pain happiness power and based on these feelings the perspective of the world changes but all these are temporary and fluctuating emotions to explore beyond our awareness management motivation and recognition of emotions one has to approach consciousness for this we go back to shri arbindo and mother again in shri arbindo's words the true vital being is wide vast calm strong without limitation form and immovable capable of all power all knowledge all ananda it is moreover without ego for it knows itself to be projection and instrument of the divine it is the divine warrior pure and perfect in it is instrumental force for all divine realizations during germination seed first moves towards the darkness darkness of its own personal unconsciousness but taking potential power from the depth of the darkness it moves towards the light for that we need to do the necessary part of our purification we have to achieve the sil- that silence and to achieve that mental silence we have to stop thinking about self only then we can achieve the mastery so our emotions move upwards towards sat chit ananda the role of education is to show the right path to raise above surface consciousness and search for inner bliss light and truth and for that tremendous will power self discipline honing the senses developing development of character is needed for this one has to quiet the mind and manage emotions and this has to happen through holistic learning and emotional education to end i will leave you with an anecdote from gautam buddha who told his five student only five student left with gautam buddha unfortunately he started journey with lots many students uh, and ananda was left all alone with him who were left with him uh, that the knowledge which he sh- i share with you is like a boat use it when you are in water do not carry on your head you are walking on the sand and i would say the same for emotions which are like boat that we have to use to swim but we cannot carry the heavy weight of emotion in our heart otherwise we find ourselves buried and overpowered in it and hence there is the need of for emotional education as something that every learner should have access to that is that is what i wanted to uh, present thank you so much thank you kiran ji very much uh, for your beautiful and uh, overall um deep presentation on the relation of the mind and the heart and uh, as sri urbind also points out this is our major problem in life a human problem psychological problem the relations of the mind and the heart they are not tuned together they are um, Uh, and the will will mind and the heart these three major components if they work together in unity then man becomes yukta uh, in the vedic terms he becomes composed he can uh, achieve anything but uh, our emotions are pulling us away our mind and dogmas and ideas about life giving us different uh, uh, path to look at and so we are kind of torn uh, and we are divided within and this division creates uh, misery about which mother speaks in her conversations that the human beings are most miserable because they really do not know what is coming and how to deal with it they are always anticipating some problems and looking for some solutions they do not know the future and they want to know the future and it is very emotional full of feelings and um, that's uh, the most miserable creature on earth uh, but there is a solution to it 
one can start um, educating oneself, start to become a master of one's own emotions and thoughts. And um, with this kind of um, thinking, I am uh, giving the microphone to Gitanjali. Uh, Gitanjali, are you with us? Yes, very much. Please, could you please elaborate uh, on uh, vital education in the practical terms? What could we do yes, uh, to, to educate yes. our children in, this, uh, in the right way? So thank you, um, Vladimir, and uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kiran, for uh, that very nice platform that you set for me, uh, you know, uh, to take on from here. So uh, taking on from what has been discussed today, uh, the problem of education that we have been always uh, discussing to me just boils down to this fact that it is a partial solution to a whole. So how come? Now, the human body is made up of this body, which we call the physical, the emotions, the mind, and also the soul or the spiritual principle in us. But for the past few hundred years, somehow, after the Industrial Revolution, where productivity and efficiency became important, we have been only been focusing on the mind. And that too, we are not doing a great job of it. We are not doing the complete mind. So that to me is the biggest issue here, that we are treating the whole with a partial solution. And while um, that can be a topic of discussion, and that is what this series is going to do every week, take you through the various aspects of education. Today, we focus ourselves, uh, our discussion on the vital education, as what Shurbindo says, or it is said commonly as emotional education. And to understand uh, emotional education, let us first try and understand what is it in us? Where is it? Uh, you must have heard of this um, explorer, uh, George Mallory. You know, he, he scaled the Mount Everest. And when he was asked that, uh, why did you do that? The answer was, because it is there. Mm -hmm. So what is it that drove him to do that? Or what is that impetus within us? that inspires us to take up this seemingly impossible mission, these lofty ideals that, you know, we seek. And that's what advances humanity, you know, from century to century. And not just gives us that initial impetus, but also sustains us with energy and enthusiasm when, in order to achieve them. Or, again, what is that source of aesthetics in us? that longs for beauty and harmony in our lives. That power which converts all our mental ideas into actions. We just spoke about how there is a disconnect between thought and feelings. Actually, feelings or emotions or this vital uh, being in us is actually responsible to convert every thought into an accomplished action. From little things like making us to jump out of bed at 5 a.m. when we have resolved to exercise regularly. Very often, as we have all experienced, when the alarm goes off, we shut the alarm, turn it to the other side, and just sleep. It's just five more minutes. But what is it that makes us get up and go once we have decided to do something? That is the seat of dynamism with, within us, which Yorbindo calls the vital. This is this vital that propels all action. It energizes everything. It enthuses all our initiatives to their accomplishment, right from getting up at five in the morning or being that conduit through which the music of Mozart and Wagner or the verses of Shakespeare and Kalidasa from their abstract beginnings in the higher planes of existence descend into concreteness. You know, so this is the vital being that we are talking about. So how to educate it and why is it difficult to educate it? Uh, you must have recently watched this movie, The Ford versus Ferrari. You know about these uh, sports cars. Uh, do you know, for instance, that a Bugatti Veyron is about 8,000 liter capacity? You know, the engine capacity is 8,000 liters. 
it is so fast that it can beat uh, a common airplane if it takes off on a race imagine such a car which either does not have a driver or just wants to go at its own speed anywhere or it is very happy to make anybody its driver what would be the condition of our roads or of anything that is what our vital uh, being is it is like a strong engine of a sports car but with one little problem that it is cut off from the higher light it is like a blind man groping in the dark and whoever holds the hand it becomes its slave so when we talk about this vital education it is this problem that we are addressing and it has been addressed for centuries together right from plato to socrates to right you know till today it has it is always considered as a difficult tyrant you know it is um, it can people just don't know how to deal with it so if we look at the historical perspective there have been two theories that emerged uh, to handle this you know 8000 liter engine one was that the what vladimir was just saying you know that happiness is considered the aim of life it has been considered for thousands of years whereas we know that happiness itself can never be sought it is the result of something it is the result of some progress it is uh, so how does one look at these emotions this happiness should one just go for it go for all the happiness and pleasure in the world should one not do it because we know of things of how it leads us to destruction so basically there have been two theories that have been um, uh, proposed by various thinkers the first is the way of the stoic you know or shankara's mayavada the advaitic approach um or stoic like zeno who say that this part of the being is too difficult to handle so therefore let us ignore it or let us not give it that expression you know we should just it should be suppressed not allowed to come up in life that was the stoic philosophy of enduring everything it was the advaitic philosophy or the stoic philosophy was to negate this emotional being okay to not allow it to participate because it can create havoc to keep it controlled the other way was that if happiness is the goal of life why not just go for it you know and that was the way of the epicure the greek philosopher during 340 bc also the charvakas the the materialist of in hinduism uh, who lived around 600 bc they advocated the same that indulge the emotional being so we had this two different opposite ways of dealing with the vital one is to completely negate it the other is to completely indulge it and then came a third way where it was considered that either of these ways is too much to handle for human nature because it was not leading to the right results so therefore came the proponents of the golden mean for instance socrates uh to plato to aristotle they all spoke about the golden mean socrates says that a man must know how to choose the mean and avoid the extremes on either side the middle part of buddha talks about the same thing abstaining from addictive self pleasure on one side and self mortification on the other confucius the doctrine of the mean speaks the same Tiruvalluvar, this the uh, from Tamil Nadu, all speak about this golden mean. So, what does this golden mean say? That do not negate it too much, neither indulge it too much. So, it is like less of both, and therefore coming at a mean. Now, how does what does Sri Aurobindo propose? You know, we have a fourth way now from Sri Aurobindo, and can you guess what he proposes? he says have more of both as we know shurabindo is not a proponent of life negating spirituality he is about life affirming spirituality it is a synthesis of all the paths till today and not just a normal synthesis of addition 
but like of synergy where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts shirbindo synthesis is that uh, synergistic way of looking at things so how does shirbindo say do not do more of both so this is what we will be looking into today so he says that the vital being need not be completely negated or discarded whereas the problems of the vital have to be purified and educated and widened so we do not negate the vital being but we negate all the negatives associated with the vital being so that is how he is more than just negating and on the other side he says indulge the vital being more but again with a caveat but not for what people commonly call happiness or pleasure or you know the superficial running after a things but indulge it to express the divine delight satchit ananda the ananda is the purpose for which the world was created yes but it has been misunderstood as the pursuit of pleasure there is a difference between pure joy and pleasure which is the pursuit of things uh, for the sake of the things so this is how shirobindo gives us this beautiful um, synthesis that vital is an indispensable instrument because shirobindo talks about life affirming spirituality it is not attaining moksha and going into the himalayan caves it is to bring down the kingdom of god on earth and as i said before anything which has to come down on earth needs the emotions the vital for its to realize its concreteness so this is the basis from where the education of the vital this is the background to why the educate the vital has to be educated it has to be allowed to become a happy instrument in the hands of the higher forces of higher intelligence and the imagine the ratha uh, let us say in today's world if there was mahabharata and if krishna was driving your bugatti veyron and you were seated within you were there the ratha of um, uh, arjuna how secure we would be in that car right so installing krishna or the divine mother as the driver of our being of our emotional being so that we can express the highest like what shakespeare and kalidasa did and make our lives meaningfully uh, you know useful is what shirobindo talks about and uh, dr kiran uh, spoke about the, uh, the purification of the senses so i would just uh, touch upon it in a very practical way uh, the how why are senses important to be purified because every knowledge that we get from this world you know is through the senses there were times in the past when there were people had intuitive understanding and they could there were more than five senses you know there were up to 12 senses in in ancient traditions but as of today we have this five senses of sight hearing touch taste uh, and smell and everything every knowledge that we get from the world is through these senses so these senses should be completely filterless they have to be completely transparent if i am uh, an artist and i i am getting inspiration from nature i cannot allow my personal likes and dislikes to come into uh, my perception of reality that i am perceiving if i am a scientist the first uh, process starts from the process of observation and in that observation i cannot allow something which is not reality to come into my experiment because it would lead to a wrong hypothesis so the development of the senses is important because they are the first gates of our knowledge from this world and to develop to pure purify the senses we have to develop our aesthetic being for instance Our aesthetic being uh, is very important 
to be developed because the entire problem of vulgarity of crudeness of violence can be handled if children from childhood are uh, taught you know about the japanese culture aesthetics is a is a, is a part of the natural surroundings and we know that even when there are these uh, calamities people stand in queues and there is a certain refinement of nature that comes through it and this aesthetic being is uh, is purified or developed through performing arts fine arts dramatic arts music dance and so on the second way is that we to develop love for noble noble and lofty things from childhood and how is it this done stories of great heroes you know children from the ages of 0 to 7 and up to 14 are full of idealism you know they want to become like they want to become le like legends and uh, through the stories of the great people like shivaji and literature poetry one can really inspire the 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 love for these noble and lofty things and finally the development of power and of precision which can be developed through sports um building of character has been much uh, discussed here uh, so i will not go into it too much except to just add that in practical terms we can always identify the positive emotions within us and negative all of us have that in a compass you know to to identify the positive emotions you know we know intuitively are love kindness compassion courage generosity selflessness the negative emotions are anger greed you know pride vanity or jealousy so how do when we are experiencing this what is the process that we can work with our emotions so the first thing is that we begin to observe them that is important we should know that right now i am experiencing this emotion the second step is to name it most of the times it is such a knot you know that we don't even know what we are experiencing so if i name it that sometimes when we are anxious we start shouting as if we are angry you know because we can't name our emotions so if we tell that this is anxiety and now i have to deal with it so naming is the second step and the third step is uh using a higher faculty than that anger which is also in us to control it uh for instance the mind or the buddhi the wisdom that we have already which knows that it is not good to be angry we know that when we are angry the negative emotions before um going outside they pass through our body and they leave a trail of you know a lot of damage uh, chemically in our body so once we know that we kind of use that it is like in a classroom uh, there are children there is no class teacher uh, so let's say our emotions are like the children in the class so the mind can be temporarily be the class leader you know who's keeping the kids in order before the class teacher comes who is this higher faculty or the soul so just behind the human heart there is a uh, there is the soul you know the psychic heart uh, which knows um, it, it knows because it is what is right and similarly we have just above our mind we have a faculty that tells us what is right and what is wrong so through reflection at night if we if we have a personal journal uh, every night before going to bed we should go over the day and try to write down when did we uh, lose our temper for instance or when did we feel that jealousy because our friends got through some college which we didn't or um, and then we write down and then we bring in our these higher faculties and then resolve not to do it again tomorrow so this is how character can be built step by step uh and there are several things which we can take up uh, during the question and answer sessions but the important thing is why should we at all uh, do this why should we have uh, a uh, a sports car towards what what is our aim where are we headed so to be able to uh, develop this 
education, emotion, uh, emotional uh, education to be able to do that, it is important that right from childhood, we develop a world view. As parents, as teachers, we should help our children develop a world view. Then we will never have answers like we want to be happy. Uh, when my son was three or four years old, I like a story, I told him this entire process of evolution. Like how, what is the purpose of this world? That how the divine came into matter and slowly matter is becoming life and life is becoming mind and then we think mind is the highest, but it is not. There is a higher super mind that we have to be. And he was four years old. And that was such a worldview. It became that once in his class, the teacher was singing the song that I wish I was in monkey land, the land where I was born. And he was uh, four years old and he raised his hand. And the teacher asked him, yes, uh, Arjun, uh, what happened? He said, ma'am, uh, we should never go backward. We should go forward. So we should sing, I wish I was in Superman land. You know, so an important thing is that the worldview can be built even when one is three years old and more so because that is the time when idealism rules, you know, children intuitively understand these archetypes, archetypes of beauty, of um, justice. And at that time, if this worldview is formed that we are here, you know, we have, we are born with a purpose and that purpose has to align with the purpose of creation and all our energies have to go into that. And therefore, the emotional uh, education becomes important because otherwise our lives go haywire. So that helps, a worldview helps in the emotional um, education. And it is never a good idea to child-proof any idea. When a child asks us something, the highest that we know we should always answer, uh, you know, be it the purpose of the world or anything, because they are smarter than us. They understand, actually. And uh, uh, I more or less feel that I should pause here and uh, take up questions now mm. uh, and, and, you know, cover the other things in the questions. So just to come uh, the discussion. We have a purpose in this world. The purpose is to realize a higher, uh, you know, uh, potentiality that we are born with. All of us are born with a higher potentiality. The vital education can either be a friend or an enemy. The vital, the emotional part in us can either lead us to that or take us away from that. It can either be a, a good slave or a bad master. So the whole purpose of vital education is to make it a good slave to that higher parts in us so that there was no big difference between Ram and Ravan in, in, in terms of the knowing. Ram was also, he knew, the, he knew Brahma, he knew um, the Vedas. But what distinguished him from Ram is that Ravan's vital was under the control of the Asuric forces. Uh, and Ram's was uh, on the forces of the divine. So that makes all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Gitanjali, for this very inspiring talk. It was beautiful. Thank you, Kiranji, again, for your vast conceptual platform of seeing the place of vital education. And now I am opening to the questions. And we received some um some already you can check with um, with uh, whatever is available and it was um, the first there was a request of Bahman uh, from CIAS uh, of uh, discussing these topics and it would be wonderful if you could have this possibility to discuss the topics of the emotions. Uh, so, but, um, there is a there is a question here I would not uh, like to name but there's okay. a question about um, and there is somebody who's written that um, somebody um, entertains thoughts of suicide you know? mm. so um, how does how can we uh, do this uh, use the vital for that mm -hmm. so I would just like to share with you um, two stories you know which um, one one is this understanding that no matter 
what it is that we are running away from by suicide there is no running away actually because in our next life we are born with 10 times more difficult situations of the same problem so the fact of evolution is that whatever difficulties are presented before us to deal with them because there's no running away even if we commit suicide it comes back again next birth and in more severity so this understanding should stop us from entertaining uh, those thoughts and the second thing is taking life as an adventure we all go for holidays and vacations you know for an adventure and what is this adventure it is it is like doing something thrilling doing something we've never done before so if we take life as an adventure and if we begin to live consciously we will see that every moment is like an adventure uh, so in adventure basically what we do is we are used to a comfort zone of living in a city life and you know having everything at our disposal so we like to go and trek in the mountains and through that adventure we are just widening our comfort zones so the same attitude if we take to li- towards life that life is not some random thing which has happened there is an intelligence a loving intelligence actually which is enveloping everything and even the most toughest of situations that are being given to us is is like a very loving teacher who gives us difficult questions so that we advance fast uh, in in life so if we take a life as an adventure and then all the difficulties that we get we use it to widen our comfort zones and therefore you know increase the field of action that we have um and many there are many examples uh, you know jk rowling she was uh, yesterday was her birthday and uh, she, it was her 55th birthday uh, she would not have lived uh, to see this birthday because 29 years ago in uh, in 97 i think she was alone uh, she had just uh, come out of an abusive marriage she had a child she did not have a job her mother had just died i mean there cannot be a worse situation than that and she was contemplating suicide but then on a walk with her child in a pram when she went into a cafe it, it, it struck her that there was this book that she had started writing a few years ago and why not start writing that and then she wrote the first chapter and all of us who have been writers we know that how it fills us with that happiness that fulfillment you know when we do something progressive like that and then the second chapter and then in within 2 years you know harry potter and the philosopher's stone was published and uh, she has today um, sold 500 million copies of her series and it is like a it's a dream of any uh, author she is in the history of publishing she is the the best uh, author the most the most well read and that's just one part of the story the other thing is she kick started this reading habit in young adults which was uh, dwindling so you know we all go through these li- times when there is something which is absolutely crushing us but that love for life uh, that is there is, is an indication that we are here for a possibility you know and the more difficult the situation the higher is our possibility to achieve its opposite so if you remember that and just go through it we'll feel like winners yes wonderful thank you geeta geeta anjali and um, of course there are more questions here um uh, about emotions and how to control emotions but uh, i would like uh, to invite uh, something are you project yeah. uh i think uh, here somebody has asked the question related to uh, emotions and feelings difference i want to show that how bharat muni introduce uh, you know how he talks about emotions and uh, how uh, not suppressing rather uh, uh, you know communicating or you know uh, expressing through this bow and uh, uh, art and uh, other forms like drama music dance if you have seen indian classical dance you know they talk about all bhava like rati hasya shok krodh uh, utsa these are all kind of they communicates emotion actually but in uh, it comes from the feelings there is a there is one more question there which you know uh, somebody is asking like what is the difference between emotion and feeling 
so it comes it when there is a sanchari bhav is there then that expressed through that uh, thai bhav which is in human and it communicates uh, to like hasya rati for example there is a hasya bhav that is emotion hasya vibhav is peculiar of dress or you know speech anubhav is if somebody is mimicking and then sanchari bhav is a smile so if we learn this these are the feelings and these are the emotion and we use art form any art form you know to communicate to express it does not get suppressed it does not remain in us so for example somebody is upset and use brushes and paint colors it is it is it gives the expression of those emotion whether it is pain or whether it is you know sublime sublimity is also there so it is very important to understand what uh, uh, gitanjali ji said that you need to identify you need to name it and for name also you know uh, in i in uh, this which mr bracket he developed one tool also i will i like to share this tool here like he uh, developed ruler acronym which i just discuss in that uh, presentation so if you and it is software also you know you it is an app if you touch any of this quadrant uh, it will communicate exactly for example right now i am sad i i've said you know feeling like i'm depressed then if you touch on the screen of that uh, app you will get exactly what kind of you know feeling you are having and why you are sad and then you go to the you have to identify the reason behind it that you are feeling and then after identifying reason you can always uh, ex- use the tool to express in a different manner instead of going into your own cocoon so there are multiple things happening and we have that literature in indian knowledge system we have that lots of things where you know we understand what is bhav anubhav and vibhav that is emotions in detail and that is why arvind was continuously saying that you know uh, we have to develop aesthetic sense we have we, and you to use this emotion so uh, western countries have given this kind of tool goldman and um, mr bracket from yale university and indian knowledge system you know long back discussed about emotions in uh, this way where uh, we can see through classical dance that is why i showed this presentation here mm. thank you thank you kevin ji um of course there yeah. is a, there is a kind of uh, i will just give you uh, G- G- gitanjali in a minute there is a, an issue with the, with the emotions and uh, feelings because uh, truly speaking we are trying to train people to to have different um, emotions yes we are trying to give to them tools how to for example meditate imagine that you are in the light on the waves of the ocean so you start using imagination you start using some kind of tools to make yourself comfortable and happy again and peaceful again and so we are dealing with these emotions already but um, truly speaking uh, this is the artificial device it will never bring a uh, final kind of uh, change in our uh, pu- purified vitality and uh, so we will never purify our vital by this we w- may gain certain kind of momentous um, release of our tension but uh, truly speaking solution lies elsewhere we have to go deeper we have to find the true meaning of our life we have to find that connection as upanishad speak about prayas and shreyas so if you go for prayas as if you if you, the aim of your life is prayas then you will be trapped one way or another you will be dealing with these emotions you will go to psychotherapists every day and you will all the time try to figure out what to do with them but if you choose the path of shreyas of the goodness the ultimate good and the dharmic path where you support the dharma of everyone of everyone being's happiness then you start looking at it from different perspective and that um deeper sense of being which is there behind that unconditional sense of uh, bliss which is always there may go through and finally become um uh, tangible and uh, perceptible to us 
So this is uh, something which is uh, already yogic view on life, yes? We have to reach deeper to ourselves and find that source of bliss, which may fill all life and find all those powers of life useful and they will join this bliss and will become part of this movement. Uh, Gitanjali, you wanted to say something. Bahman is waiting, I guess. Uh, Bahman, would you like to discuss because you are still um, still waiting? You were asking first to for the discussion, and I, well, thank you. I, I I think that some of uh, some of the conversation is already addressing what I asked. Um, uh, in my own mind, I I, I think of feelings as. Um, as something that we experience, like lived experience. And there are a number of different types of feelings, the quality. Uh, and when we talk about emotions, to me, that seems like more of a concept. It's, it's more about um, dynamism and energy and how, you know, we can reflect on it and understand it. So, um, so to me, actually, the the feeling and and working with feelings and understanding the feelings is is more of a foundational principle and I, and I was hoping that um, you know um, that would be just you know brought up as a as a topic because I think as long as we talk about emotions we're talking about it uh, more of a whole person uh, set of variables that get entangled it's really you know an emotion is not just an an experience in the moment even though we use this word all the time but it's more like feeling is what we feel you know like that chart that was shown like i'm feeling sad and so on so anyway i i just leave it open in terms of um, actually working with feelings and uh, and then understanding emotions, you know, I, I see them in this in this light. But but I think we already started a conversation on that. So so thank you very much. Thank you, Bahman. It's a very important distinction between senses, uh, sensory um, kind of activities of the vital of feelings and emotions. In in the system, in the vision of these three, we could see that the emotions are more, how to say painted with the mind, with the concept, idealism, beauty, aesthetics. These are the emotions which can be formulated in the mind as concepts, whereas feelings are more like impulses or, uh, or the states of being, something which is, which is unknown to us. We feel it rather than we understand it. So then we start trying to understand it and they become emotions, as it were. We already bring the mind into that activity. So there are three levels of the of the vital. The highest is emotions. Uh, these are higher emotions, and even which may lead us to the higher aspirations in life. There is the middle part, which is proper feelings, proper. Uh, impulses of the vital, the very force of being afraid or being jealous or being, uh, you know, having desires. We didn't speak about desire in this session, which is a very important topic altogether. And um, then we have the sense sensations in the body, which are more connected to the physical body, like a heat, like uh, itching, like uh, pain in the body. These are also vital uh, connections to the physical body, and that is the triple vital, as it were, you know, say in the Veda, known as uh, Trini Rajansi, three vital levels. Yeah. And they correspond to what we know in the Tantric tradition as uh, Anahata Chakra, Manipura Chakra, and uh, Svadhisthana Chakra. So these are these are three chakras on the torso. This is our vital realm. Yeah. Very, very complex and requires a lot of study and understanding of these components. Thank well, you. Vladimir, for your, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. There is a question here that how we teach young children whose mind is not uh, developed. Yes, please. This, very, this question is very dear to my heart because uh, I have worked uh, with my child when he was four. Today he's 18. 
and I had tried to very consciously put into practice all that I studied in Shurabindu and the mother. So the first thing is that children only learn um, at that age what they see. So it is only by imitation. I mean, it is not by instruction at all. Like if you, you don't have to even say anything. If you are the one getting up at five, going for a run, they will start doing that, you know. And uh, if you are engaged whole day in something meaningful, you are not watching television. Uh, they just do that. They just see you being meaningfully engaged. So leading by example, not just at four or five, even later. Because even later when they are 12 or 14 and they develop a mind, you may it may appear that for some time they are self-willed or they are doing whatever. But these childhood sanskaras, as they are called, what has been experienced by them always stays with them. So that is the first thing to do, to lead by example. The second is to in, expose them to all the beautiful things in the world because they are full of idealism at that time. You know, all the beautiful stories, all the you know, heroism, courage, valor, you know, surround their life with beautiful things. They are full of energy. So what I did was my son was the one bundle of energy. So at the age of five, I got a karate teacher at home. And, uh, you know, uh, it, that used to really help him work out and, and, and channelize. Most of the parents would give a tablet and make them sit in front of a television because that controls them. But when that energy is not being uh, used, so, you know, if you engage them in sports or uh, in arts or uh, you know, so their energy is channelized into something positive. And I do, did that karate with him and both of us together became black belts. And it was so happy moment for him because he used to feel very proud that other people's mothers just come and sit and the kids only do. But my mama can also do it. And so it was uh, very um, and inspiring for him that mama can also do and he would feel very proud and uh, so both of us became black belts and also we won the world championship together in this fun and laughter you know so uh, being an example to your child not just when they're four but all through is the is the key beautiful thank you for this example yes it's wonderful to have such mother who is who is ready to fight with you <laughs> for the black belt and championship <laughs> when you are a kid it's wonderful <laughs> yes yes and you did many more things with Aryan and uh, hindustani music and piano music and uh, swimming and gymnastics and so on and so forth and dance and singing everything was given to him to to fulfill his need for this vital depth of vital and purity and uh, clarity of vitality in him that's why he grew up such a brilliant child he's I already not a child he is an adult <laughs> young adult but it, and it, it is very mutually um, what do you say enriching you know because you get a chance, or a lot of women say that, you know, now that we are married, all our hobbies. I say, no, this is your second chance with your children. You know, do it again with them. And uh, it inspires them and uh, you get to, you know, uh, do it that you had missed out. Yes, wonderful. And thank you. Thank you, Gitanjali, for this, for sharing your personal story. Um, and... Uh, once this vital vital has been uh, purified, it becomes a very enjoyable journey, actually, because you have this source of power with you at your beck and call. You know, it is uh, it can help you with all the great visions that you envisage. You know, um, it helps you to realize it on Earth, and um, it, it really becomes a beautiful ride after that. There is one more question. Uh, should we keep them away, children away, from what we understand to be negative influences? Until what age? At what age are they ready for the entire range of emotions, Sarasas? This is a very provocative question, I think, and a very interesting. How would you answer? What, what, do you have some thoughts? So um, I can tell you what Plato said and what Shirobindo said and what I did. 
Mm-hmm. So Plato says that from zero to seven, when the child is developing his uh, physicality and he should be exposed to nature, beauty, and all of that, and also from seven to fourteen. But from fourteen to eighteen, when the mind has developed and he, and all these good influences have gone in, then they become the basis on which the decisions can be taken. And strike strangely, I find the same thing in Shirobindo, who says that till fourteen. it is the duty of every parent to tell the child what should be done what should not be done and as much as possible keep them in this uh, idealism in this world of beauty and harmony because after 14 they automatically get exposed to it in the world and they have by then if their sensibilities have not been spoiled with all this uh, negativity then they develop a right compass as i said develop in this in, inside see it we can never keep advising them this is a mistake indian parents make even after they are married and they are 50 they are always telling them the children what to do but shirobindo says that from the age of 14 just let them be you know only if they come to you for advice advise them otherwise even let them even fail let them learn through failure that is important learning but your job is before the child is born when he is in the mother's uh, womb from there on his uh, the education starts or even before he is in the mother's womb that's when your uh, work starts to aspire for the right kind of child you know and uh, then tr- during the time he is in the womb to be you know uh, to be engaged in all, everything which is beautiful and positive we know so many stories of abhimanyu and others who were influenced when they're in their wombs and then by the time they are 5 10 and 14 by the time they are 14 i think we we leave them to experience the world whereas it is the opposite you know children are just conceived without even any conscious planning and then childhood they're just made to sit in front of the television nothing is done and by the time they are 14 and they should be allowed to be free all kinds of parental controls that take this career or do that come in you know so we've got it all wrong and that is why uh, there is a problem mm, wonderful beautiful thank you thank you gitanjali All right any more questions I think we have exhausted the topic and generously overshot the time right like uh, we were happy to be part of this large family and discuss this all these issues are very universal and we all have to learn from each other yes beautiful so uh, maybe at uh, this uh, moment i will uh, thank everyone uh, kiran ji and gitanjali ji for this beautiful presentation and radhe for introduction of uh, um, introducing us to new perspectives which we uh, started as the um, webinars uh, regular webinars to discuss this profound topics and uh, next uh, time we will have on the 7th of um, uh, august uh, continuation of this topic on vital education presentation by dr alok pandey uh, so please join us and join with your questions and participation it would be wonderful that we continue this a uh, line of thought and maybe it will become helpful for educationists to implement and to start looking into their curriculum and develop some kind of um, emotional intelligence cor- intelligence uh, s- subjects or curriculum which will be uh, helping uh, students to develop this emotional intelligence uh thank you all and uh, all the best namaste namaste thank you thank you all organizers radhe dr kiran and most of all vladimir thank you